We'll okay, oh, I oh. will call the meeting to order. I don't have the mic that magnifies my voice tonight, so I will do the best I can. But if you can't hear me, ask me to repeat myself. So I will call the meeting to order at 6.30. And I want to start tonight with an exciting announcement from the Agency of Education. A teacher at Essex High School has been chosen the Vermont Teacher of the Year. All right. Her name, I'll probably mess up with this, her name is Linda Clodier Nander. All right, good for her. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Linda Clodier Nander. Clodier Nalbar? Nandar. Nadar. C L O U T I E L. And the Latin, the hyphen name is N A N D E R. So I think that's English. 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 Um, I think that's pretty exciting for our district. Okay, I don't have any changes to the agenda. And I don't see any <coughs> visitors to be heard. So let's move to the consent agenda. Um, does anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda? Brendan. I have questions about the um, donation. So I'm wondering if that should be removed so I can ask a question. Okay. Why did I not have the donation? Uh, took the newer one, that one out. Huh, I oh. thought that's what I was looking at. Okay. Um, you want me to make a motion for the consent agenda? Yeah, for the rest of it. I move that we approve the uh, <coughs> consent agenda, uh, including the items, uh, board minute meetings of September 12th and September 19th, 2017, and approval of warrants. Okay. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Thank you. All right, so we have pulled the item to accept a donation for um, from Vermont Systems for the EHS Athletic Department. Brendan? So um, my question is, um, does the district have a policy for the acceptance of donations like this one? So there used to be a policy, and in this transition moving to a new district and new <coughs> policies, this one did not get transferred over. So we put it here for the first time, and then I do think you should have a discussion. I'm not necessarily sure that it needs a policy, but it should. I should run by the gifts and donations by you. Right. You could make a motion to have me do that or however you want to do it but i don't think it's need needs and policy exactly um you could set an, an amount if it is over ten thousand dollars or i right. mean you could do it that way too is accepting donations a regular thing that we do yes and specifically for athletics yes. probably most of them come through athletics <laughs> and so is it a donation um like a charitable contribution or is it actually a, a gift that then results in some benefit to the company advertising sponsorships no, this is a this is a donation so they don't get anything in return for the gift no they actually don't even care to be noticed okay and i said to jeff goodrich well it will be in the minutes because i do want it <laughs> <laughs> to bring it forward i just know that um especially at the college and university level the there usually are pretty strict and tight rules around accepting donations in exchange for what's actually sponsorship of athletic right. either yeah. uh, facilities or teams or what have you. So um, this sounds like it probably doesn't fall into that bucket, but um, it makes me, it, it raises a few red flags for me, but um, I guess I would be interested to see if the district feels like it it needs to have a policy around <coughs> this kind of thing we have lots of policies right um, 
and it would seem strange that we wouldn't have a policy that, it would, that would at least outline the process by which we accept donations. Um, this is a, a company that we obviously feel good about. They're a local company, but um, would we accept a gift from any company or any group? So nothing, I'm not making a proposal for anything. I'm just suggesting that it might no, be something to, I, to just I think you make a good point. I know we don't want to load ourselves down in policy, but if we have a policy, then we won't have to keep having discussions uh, when things come forward. Yeah, I think so. the worst possible scenario would be if the board had to approve every contribution that was made or review every contribution okay. that was made. And I don't that think that's something we, we had to make a decision about something controversial when it was in front of us instead of having considered what we want our policy to be right. before it's in front yeah, of us. Exactly. Patrick. Um, I'm not familiar with them. Uh, what does Vermont Systems do and does the district do any business with them? I actually don't know that. They're a software company based on ethics. That's okay. a great question. So, I mean, I would have no problem if we had no business with them whatsoever, okay. but if at any point we've contracted with them, then this looks bad. So I guess I would like to answer that question at some point. Well, it doesn't necessarily. It doesn't necessarily. It doesn't necessarily, but right. there's, you know, I mean, there, people will read between lines that aren't necessarily there. Optics. Yeah. yeah. Well, and sometimes, that, again, at the college and university level, a vendor, um, after they are selected as a vendor, will sometimes make a contribution to the college and university after the fact. Um, and so that would be something I would think we would want to make sure that we have some kind of policy around. I think as long as we're certain that they haven't been chosen as a vendor in exchange for giving us a donation, right. I, I, don't, I don't think we would want to exclude our vendors from making charitable contributions to the system. Oops, I think Martha's next. I was going to say I had the same basic question Brendan did. I just wanted to make sure that there's, we don't have to put a name or a banner up in the right. gymnasium, so I was glad. You we don't have to buy only Coke products. And, and I, yeah, I right, think right. CCSU, <clears throat> I know as a Prudential Committee member, we did accept donations, and it was throughout the year, not a lot of them, but there were periodic uh, donations, so I'm pretty sure there is a policy that I'm we sure can look we have. at from both There's districts. There's definitely a and policy. And I am totally yeah. in favor of accepting yeah. donations. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we have policy that protects the district. With this donation, it's at will, choose as we see fit, as long as it benefits the athletic department as a whole, but it's not specifically to one team or one sport. Nope. Athletic department. As a whole, okay. Okay. All right. Um, are we ready for a motion? I'll entertain a motion to approve the donation of $4,700 to the athletic department. So moved. Thanks, Brendan. Oh, 4700 or 47000 47, Oh, never mind. Forty-seven hundred. Forget. That would be something. Let the record show. It's forty-seven hundred. Yes. I'll retract. Okay. All right. All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right. And I think I have heard Diane that we would like the policy committee to work on an acceptance of gifts policy. I think we got a few that we need to look at. Okay. <laughs> All right. So tonight we're going to have a presentation on um, our district's demographics and our SPAC data. So Amy Cole, I think everyone knows Amy. Um, welcome and um, take it away. So I wasn't here when you put in this request, so I hope that I met your needs with the data that I put here. This is a little bit different for those of you who had me stand here in every fall. Your data, um, 
Um, Beth did ask that it be sort of a broader look around sort of who are our students um, and less sort of that, um, that micro piece about our student performance results. I'm happy to answer any questions about the performance results and I'm happy to come back with deeper things, but our approach on this one was a little bit broader. So I hope that this meets your needs. And I don't have a mouse, so I'm just gonna click here. Do you want me to click while you? You wanna click? Yep. So you have a hard copy of this, and if you didn't get a hard copy, I can give it to you, and I hope that it printed in such a way that I don't cause you to squint. Um, so just some quick facts about us as a new district. It was actually kind of fun to read this, or to write this, and say, oh, we're 10 schools. Um, we had a long debate about exactly how many students we have, because we've seen this number on, uh, very different on lots of different forms, and we were sort of blaming the complexity of preschool and CTE and the EHS students who are CTE for the confusion. So this is the number we're sticking by for today, depending on which report you look at. Is that, okay, so that's not pre k We believe this includes our public pre-K students. No, well, the 315. That includes the 315. No, See, I did this not. Isn't a fun this debate. is we do this all, all, we all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the three thousand eighty. Uh, the three thousand eight hundred thirty-five <laughs> do not include the pre-K. Right. But in the two community two days but it does include the ones in the school-based programs. It. No, the three fifteen is the total pre. -K. Total pre-K, and well, including. You, you would think this would be easier to answer. It, it's. It's not as easy to answer. The 3,835 do not include the CTE students. They include it our does EHS include CTE our Essex High School EHS students, EHS. students that are So in other words, from the agency point of view, they view enrollment as one definition. Then when we look at our own data and we look at the students that we're serving, we look at it in a slightly different way. So for example, we have a little bit of our 100 students that are EHS students who are enrolled in EHS who attend CTE, and they sit on our accounts in two different ways. So we always have to kind of remember to separate that out because there's almost 400 CTE students, 300 of which are not enrolled in our schools, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. the students who attend pre-K at Summit, Hiawatha, Westford. and Westford, are they in the first number, the second number, or both? They're in the second number. And is that, they're counted differently for the agency they're of education not right now. Based. I know. I feel I more comfortable well, actually going back and researching this one again. We actually, four of us <laughs> had to sit in a room. It's not the out, end of the world. Or believe it or not. We're so off to a either stage start. file. We're stuck or in it's pre K, in, it may include the pre Ks that are in our buildings in those mornings. Why don't we, we go back and we'll, program we'll give you all, actually, we've seen three or four, <laughs> actually, four or five different numbers. <laughs> Why don't we get you all of those numbers and tell you what's going <laughs> <Yes. a good laughs> I mean, she laughed, but like, when yeah, Beth told me that she was being interviewed for being this superintendent for the largest district, I went, we? Yeah. We were second. That was my and we question. actually started with that, like, before you go off to this interview, are we? Are we second? Uh -huh. Does it count CT? Does it not count CT? So it really does come down to, depends on who you ask and which students you're counting. We're a little under 4,000 students. Let's go from there. Yeah, we'll stay with that. We're a little under 1,000 staff members. And um, a four, four, this year, 461 uh, teachers. Thank you. Phew, that was the first slide. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of socioeconomic indicators, we know that free and reduced lunch does not always tell the whole story, but this is the number that we have for you today, which is that right now we're at 22% um, students who are eligible for <coughs> free and reduced lunch. Um, and just to give you sort of an image of what that looks like, free and reduced lunch eligibility reflects an annual income of less than $25,000 for a family of four. Mm -hmm. Except, didn't we? Um, that's for free lunch. Yeah. Reduced lunch would have a different definition. This is a collapse. Even though rate. we treat them this yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, the 25,000 does. But the, tw the 22 represents those that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Um, and we range from, in our schools, it's actually not a very wide range. From, uh, this year it's between 19% over in Westford and 29% in, Ohio, in um, Fleming. Um, but by and large, we fall, sort of our schools are somewhere around the 24%, our district average being 22 this year. Homelessness. Um, homelessness is, a, a, the title itself is a, um, it's uh, a title some folks are not su super comfortable with. We have an act called the McKinney-Vento Act that defines homelessness pretty broadly. Um, we do know that there are people who fit in that category who don't often access our services, in large part because they may not necessarily view themselves in terms of that identity. But we do typically support between 15 and 30 students experiencing homelessness each year. Um, yep. 
question about the Fleming having the highest percentage this year. Um, do we see like cohorts of people that are worse off economically? Um, related usually to. You no, know, I guess where I thought you were going was where I was going in my head in terms of um, particularly for. Um, Essex Junction, where we have such small transitions from school to school, you could see Hiawatha be 31 year, next year, you know, one year, and, and Fleming be 23, and vice versa, because families move up through the systems. It's not like a trend of something happened in the economy, and then we'll see like. Since I've been here since 2011, we've been floating around 20 to 23,000. Yeah. Um, I would say that Westford kind of goes up and down a little bit at times, and this time it's a little bit on the high end, but with a low end count, that can go up and down quite a bit. Our high schools slowly crept closer and closer to the district average. One thing to bear in mind though, um, percentages are probably gonna get more acute and more distinguished as their population has fallen over the years. It could, that could represent. Because yeah, in Westford, I know um, mm -hmm. we're looking at a body of 180 students, so the number of students yep. is going to be a higher percentage than it was five years ago. Right, and those are maybe the same number. Right, and those are school-based with a larger end number that it's a little bit more stable. Um, the other thing, and I, I actually, um, this one was actually harder to get than I thought, and I, um, if I have another day, I could get it for you. The town census data doesn't sometimes match our free and reduced lunch numbers, which is a curious one for us, and there's always been this sort of wondering about as the students get older and older, are they, are they um, less likely to complete that form? So typically high schools tend to always have a lower average of yes. reduced lunch than their elementary schools, which kind of <coughs> makes common sense. Um, so anyway, that's where we stand. Okay. Oh. Yes. Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, Fleming and what other school, but how about the town of Essex? Or how? Pretty comparable. Oh, okay. But when I ha and I actually, when I had to ready myself for the consolidated federal grants, our allocations are based on that. I thought, oh my gosh, how far off are we? Because that could kind of alter um, allocations uh, between Essex Junction and Essex Town, pretty comparable. I think it was between 21 and a half and 22. Wow. Mm -hmm. In terms of ethnicity, this is our breakdown for ethnicity. We are still predominantly white, 87%. That number has been decreasing over time, but not at a, a huge pace. Um, we have, and these are self-identified. So in other words, the families identify whether or not they would mark off sort of multiracial or Asian or black or Hispanic. Um, we ha have um, been increasing steadily. Many of you know, for those that have been on the other end of me coming to you saying, our numbers have gone up again. We need another ELL teacher. We are up to almost 300 ELL students this year. Um, the number, the reason that this one doesn't necessarily match is because literally they were moving in as I was putting the number here. So we currently serve 189 students that are found eligible for ELL services. I think an additional three moved in this week. Um, and 106 that are currently in our system that have exited ELL services. In other words, they've successfully gone through the program and exited, but we keep that information on file in case they run into any kind of academic issues over time. Students in both of these categories, the families in either of these categories, often access our translation services. So in terms of staffing, we have eight ELL teachers. When I started, we had two. And now that we've combined, we're up to eight ELL teachers. Um, they're a big group. Um, we have one Nepali speaking liaison um, and 14 on-call translators that are serving, currently serving 13 languages. In other words, we work every year to identify which families need what kind of translation services. And some students and families speak certain languages, but they don't need the translation services. And we provide ELL summer experiences and after-school tutoring for our ELL students. I'm sorry, I was busy signing this. I'm a fast talker and, too, so slow me down. Okay. Uh, when I'm looking up there, English language learners, 289 students. Yeah, I just noticed that this number doesn't match because I students moved in here and I forgot to increase my number over here. So that should be 189? You should have 200 and what's this number? 95. Yeah, thank you, 95. Um, literally, our ELL families, between June and uh, October 15th, we tend to, at the CCSU side, experience at least 30 new students that are registering constantly. So that number doesn't kind of settle until mid-October. These are the languages that are in our schools that I was able to track. <laughs> it's pretty impressive, over 40 languages. Awesome. You've probably been out of schools and noticed a flags hanging. It's something I think I'm, I'm quite proud that our school leaders and our staff have really taken an appreciative lens to our changing diversity, and you'll see um, I think Suzanne Grunling called me and she's like, I'm so excited, I get a new flag. <laughs> <laughs> we get new flags, so we're trying to take that lens. Um, 
And we do, I, I guess I have your ear on this one, the, the appreciative lens lends itself to academic services as well. I'm really proud of the high school for making the move, uh, I think it was three or four years ago. Many um, high schools waive a word language requirement for ELL students and Essex High School um, grants a word language credit. And what we do is we ask ELL students to come and say, would you like this to be granted on your credit? And we work with an actful service and they actually come and they sit, Andrew Roy manages it for us, and they perform their language to someone on the phone who assesses them and says you're fluent in that language and then we award them with a word language credit. So that's just an example of trying to find an appreciative approach to our changing culture. Nice. Any questions here about what these languages are? <laughs> there are times I get a call from an ELL teacher and say, I need a translator in what language? Say that again. <laughs> you can see the little bit of a breakdown here. Definitely Nepali is our lead right now, followed by Arabic and Vietnamese. Um, a growing group is a Somali. Um, in the last year, we've increased uh, pretty quickly in our Somali population, which speaks both my my and Somali Somali. And we have a translator who speaks both. Ready? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Student support services. We're only going to do one slide on this one because we know that Aaron and Dylan are going to be coming to you, I think, at your next board meeting yes. to do a deeper look at student services. But we wanted to include this in a broad overview. Currently, 592 students, students with disabilities, are eligible for special education, 143 with 504 plans. Are you familiar with the term EST, Educational um, Support, Support Team Plans, yeah. which is that tier two intervention, 446. And then just we have a broader sense of intervention services where we don't necessarily go through a full on EST um, process, but we identify kids for short term intervention. So another 210. This is here just to sort of give you a sense of the, the, um, the types of resources and the flexibility with those resources that are required in each of the schools to meet the needs of the students. Okay, Center for Technology Essex. We currently this year have 389 students. I love Carrie Dickinson because when I sent this out to her and Bob, she immediately zipped off this information to me. So this is our current enrollment. Um, <laughs> enrollment does continue for another few weeks throughout the, the, um, the CTE application process. One thing to notice is that they have, I think it's typically they have about 13 different feeder schools. I didn't count these up, but that sounds about right. They also serve adults with diplomas and adults without diplomas. Our highest contributor this year is Essex High School. Um, and that they current, in their current class, 70% of the students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And 46 are on an IEP or have a 504 plan. Mm -hmm. Would you remind me how students come from outside of her catchment district to the Tech Center for Technology? I'm going to say this because I'm fairly certain that what I'm going to say is true. And then I would want to ask Bob and Carrie for sure because they know these regulations much better than I do. I believe that they would arrive on our doorstep if they're not, if their area doesn't provide a program. But I also think that there's a new complexity around high school choice that may yes, have opened up some opportunities. And that last piece, I'm not entirely sure I understand how that's worked. Um, and then we do have tuition paying students. There are yeah. students. Yeah, there are students who can access it, but they're not allowed to. <coughs> and uh, mm -hmm. I was going to say, uh, a number of those students coming from outside of Essex can and do take classes at Essex High School, right. such as English, because other they're full subjects. Day program. Right. Yeah. They are unique in that they're a full day program. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then this is what um, their program enrollment looks like in terms of the programs. And I did collapse a couple of them just to fit it on your screen. But you can see this year, this is what it looks like of the 389 students. This year it looks like Pre-Tech pre is their largest one, followed by Professional Foods, Computer Animation, Web Design, and Building Technology. I would encourage you, um, if you have not had a chance to get to know the, the CTE programs or even have Bob and Carrie come to a presentation for you, it's pretty tremendous, the opportunities that they have and the resources for the students. And I would also say the degree to which the staff really work to meet the needs of the individual students in those programs. These are students who come in at all kinds of hours, depending on how they get bussed in or get driven in. They may have them for a year. Their relationships with their feeder schools are tremendous on behalf of these students. Next. Okay, here you go, SBEC scores. You've probably seen them already. Um, they hit the paper, so um, they produce Everybody's been around long enough to know what SDEC is. That's our state assessment in English, language, arts, and math. We now have three years' worth of data. Um, 
what I did is I put for you the Essex Westford compiled or um, uh, commingled. So in other words, I looked, put all the schools together and I think last spring was the first time I was able to kind of access that and look at it together against the state of Vermont. They don't, unlike um, NECAP, collapse them by grade level. So we have to sort of do that mathematically. What they do is they produce it publicly by grade level, which is why in some of our um, slides that you're going to see, you're going to see a score missing and that's because there may be a um, a disaggregated subgroup that has such a small number that the Agency of Education won't report it publicly. But these are our, our uh, scores this year. Science NECAP scores will be out in another few weeks. We just received our verification letters today. There's, typically we would have had those by now, but they're a little bit late. And on a side note, this was our last year of uh, administering Science NECAP. We're doing a new state assessment in science this spring. It's um, going to be piloted. It's on the computer. We know very little about it. Uh, we hear it's coming late May, and we know we won't receive the results. Well, we think we won't receive the results. So we're going to have a, a miss of a year for science results and state assessment results. And I did mention that in the last presentation that I gave around ed quality standards and ESSA that the grade 11, it will be in grade 9. Right. That's back. Yeah, so the major changes in, that we've... Um, this is a whole other presentation. Major <laughs> changes are that SVEC is moving from grade uh, 11 to grade 9. So this is the first year that ninth graders will be taking a state assessment. And that's for English language arts and math. Science NECAP is going away. and We're having a new pilot test that we don't know a whole lot about yet, but it's coming our way. And we've been told that we'll have a physical fitness exam coming our way this spring. And we have uh, hopes that we'll have more information about it in the next month. <laughs> <laughs> See how I said that? <laughs> Um, in terms of just other uh, data for you to look at, not all students take SAT or ACT, um, but those students who do, we receive the collated results. And so you can see how our students are doing against um, Vermont results and US results in terms of critical reading, writing, math, English, reading, math, and science. I know this is a lot of data points, just have you stare at them, and I apologize for that. We have them here. You do have them there. And keep in mind, all of these, this prior slide and this slide is a single year, I think. I know I have it on our website. I can't remember if I put a slide. When you flip, maybe I'll see whether or not I did the three-year comparison. I did not. I wanted to focus on achievement gaps. It's something that we've talked about a lot. So I looked at poverty and I looked at students with disabilities. Um, this year, we continue to have an achievement gap similar to um, a state achievement gap for students of poverty and students with disability. Um, it's something that we look at. It's, it causes for conversation, the equity conversation that we have. Um, I, like I said, it's not unlike the state um, achievement gap. And I just picked grades 3, 8, and 11 to look at. Uh, for a number of years, I was following grade 11 alone to see if we were starting to close that achievement gap, and it tended to be cohort to cohort. We had one year where the math one took a considerable um, um, improvement, um, but it again followed cohort to cohort. And the next one is disabilities. Students with disabilities, and Aaron Dillon and I were talking about in particular math is one that we have concerns about. The challenge with this, um, even as it's disaggregated, what we do is we take a look at students on a student by student basis. In other words, students with disabilities is a pretty broad term. So in other words, this doesn't tell us are these tell students with literacy disabilities or math disabilities or physical disabilities. So really, when we look at this data globally, the first thing we do is drill further down. So I sit with principals and we look at their SPEC scores next to how they would do on their local assessment data, next to their classroom observations. Um, and that's where we start to really pull that out. One of the pieces um, that I'm particularly excited about, the, um, we were unable to do this with NECAP. SBAC was set up in such a way that we have um, scaled scores. And so I'm able to see the growth of a student in a scaled score now three years in a row. And that's been an interesting thing for us to kind of wrap our heads around which students are making at least a year's worth of growth mm -hmm. and what services have been in place for them. So our, should we assume that our number of students in grade, grade eight, eight we had less than ten? Too small. In 
yeah, it, I, and I thought that was wrong initially, and I thought, that doesn't seem right, and we went out and looked, and Erin said, yeah, she said, I did a similar presentation where I found last year's grade eight had a small end count that we couldn't report on for students with disabilities. Okay. And then, just the efforts, I, you know, was brainstorming the kinds of things that I see in my work. I'm sure that there's more here that we think about. Um, you know, the term that I heard uh, a few years ago was opportunity gap rather than achievement gap. In other words, what are those opportunities that our students, that we can put in place for our students? Um, and so we think about what is, what's the access to academic and recreational activities in and outside of school, access to intervention services, flexible learning opportunities, pre-K opportunities, enrichment programs, flexible learning. So when we think of, when we look at these and we say, so what is it that we can do? We start to think about what kind of programming do we have in place to make sure that there's equitable opportunities for students. And I grabbed a couple numbers for you, if you want to hit the next one. We do have a, uh, this year 130 eighth grade students participating in what we're calling the EWSD Algebra Seminar. In other words, we had a task team work high school, middle school wide to build a common algebra experience in our three middle schools. So we have 130 students accessing that. We do have 121 EHS students taking over 192 courses. In other words, some of them are taking more than one. They're either dual enrollment or we um, work with two different vendors for online learning. 105 were non-college and 87 were college courses. We have um, a third we have a third academy at the high school now. So we've historically had our STEM Academy, we've had our Academy for Visual Performing Arts, and now we have our Global Leadership Academy. So 239 students are participating in one of those three academies. And we have 120 EHS students attending technical education programs here, I think four at Burlington and the remaining 116 here at the CTE. I think that might have been your last slide. I know this feels a little bit like spaghetti at the wall. I hope I met some of your requests in terms of broad information. Dang. Okay. In, in dealing with flexible learning opportunities, I, okay. I don't see a, the ACE program mentioned here, and they would be a And I didn't. Component. I was literally jotting down things and catching numbers, so that's one that, yeah, we have, we have a number of programs outside of this that I didn't include in this. Okay. So the ACE program is an alternative program for high school students. I'm just trying to... I feel like I've mean, got a block on it, but the 121 EHS students taking 192 courses. Have them repeat that to me a couple times. What does that mean? In other words, there are students taking more than one course. They're doing they're enrollment or, or online non-college courses. So 121 kids, this is the way it was framed for me. I had to repeat it a couple times. They're they accessing this service. And then how many of those courses have we signed on for 192 of them? In the dual enrollment or online, right? Right. right. So, so for one example, student, my son took a couple. My son took two dual enrollment courses. Yeah. Yes. I knew there was some part of that that wasn't going straight to the top. So <laughs> can we go back to the SBAC scores for yes. a minute? Um, Which one? The uh, first keep one? going. There you yeah. go. Yeah. Um, I've looked. So I've looked at data like this for many years, and what is often not helpful is to see us compared to the state or to the country mm -hmm. or if I heard that. Um, because we always yep. dramatically outperform both what's more interesting to me is our progress year to year mm -hmm. and I was surprised to learn through the Essex reporter that um, our SBAC scores year over year were not great and so just wondering when we're gonna have an opportunity to discuss uh, to, to discuss the most recent performance Let me pull up. This one may be helpful for folks to see. Oh, let's see, where did I put it? Is that too small to look at? Let me get bigger. So what I wanted to do, and this is the all students group. This is not a disaggregated group. So I wanted to see, what I did is I went backwards and I collated Westford, Essex Town, and Essex Junction together for the three through eight. Rather than break them out, I do have them broken out separately. Um, but I kind of wanted to see them together retroactively. So if you look at, um, percent almost looks like a funny thing doesn't it mm -hmm. um, you'll see it, this group is three different groups of sixth grade students so one of the things that I do with the principals and I do it on a school by school basis is I look at this right 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 so while we know that the test is a little bit different is there something going on with the cohort and that helps us with program planning we had a group of particular uh, year uh, two years no, last year that we looked at and said oh there's something kind of going on with this group what do we need to put in front of them right we definitely saw and were disappointed by, where am I, grade 11? Yeah. We were pretty consistent and then took a drop. 
pretty consistent, and then took a drop in the same cohort. So I met with the admin team and said, what happened? You know, we gave it early this year. Could that have been it? We had a snow day in the middle of them. Is it our practice of closing the school down and giving it? Was it the cohort of students? So what we need to do is look at those results against their uh, local assessment data to kind of see is, is that matching up in some way or was it a set of circumstances that caused that? I do know that one of the decisions that the agency of ed made to, for, to move it from 11th grade to grade nine was based on a little bit of a hypothesis that kids might be over assessed at grade 11, that may or may not be true. But it was, I think it was one of the factors that caused them to say, let's look at moving it to grade nine and see if that's more helpful. I am looking forward to having a consistent three through nine. I think that's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't think I answered your question. Well, I guess, you know, I guess my larger point is because we haven't yet gotten to the point of determining um, what our desired outcomes are for kids and what metrics we're going to use as sort of, you know, our standard for measuring our performance as a district. How much weight do we give these? We see alarming headlines in the local paper. Uh, you get parents asking questions about, are we, are we you know, is, is our quality getting worse? Um, so I think that this is just a slice of information. I, I understand it's not the whole story. But until we get to the point where we, we decide how much importance we're going to give SBAC in terms of our overall assessment of our performance as, as a district, you know, these kind, this, these kind of data points can be either misleading or alarming, depending on how you look at them. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I would agree with you. And I will also say that when I work with the administrators, we look at that first number. Now, this number, English Language Arts, is actually broken down into reading, writing, research. Um, and then what we do is we look at those scores, and then we look at the individual students to see how does that reading score match up with their star reading assessment. Is it close? Are, they, are we off in some way? And so that drill down is something that is hard to present publicly. One of the things we did last year, um, a number of the schools looked at what are those multiple indicators, and then can we formalize these things matter as a conversation starter. So um, up, up in Westford, we identified um, two points on their progress report, two or three points on their progress report, um, how they're doing on their writing record for reading, how they're doing on their um, uh, our local math assessment, how they're doing on our, if three or four of these sort of ding, that's a conversation starter. So now what do we do? What do we look at? So that is hard to present publicly. I agree with you. Right. And how do you use this data? I, I might just forget. How do you use this data to actually intervene with kids that are struggling in a particular academic area as a program when you say economic area yeah i mean our sbac is the kind of test where you can pluck out an individual student's performance and identify a kid in need of assist you know assistance and support with mathematics for example yep we can actually do that with all of our assessments both essex town and uh, the Chittin former Chittenden central schools have we have two different data systems in place right, right now but both of them are set up in such a way that any data we pull in we can pull out based on economic or free and reduced lunch students with disabilities ell students and start to look at it that way right so not only here would we see an achievement gap but we could see it on our local assessment data right um you know, it's on a kid, a kid basis, and it's a roster by roster basis. So we look at cohorts. Oops, what's going on with third grade? Do we need to put something in place? Um, what's going on with these particular students? Is this intervention working? Right. So some of the conversations I had, I'm thinking of, I keep pointing at Westford because you're Westford, <laughs> um, because I had this conversation with, with Marcy is, so the students that made at least a year's worth of growth, they were a one last year on SBEC. They're a one this year. But their scaled score showed that they made more than a year's worth of growth. What intervention did you use? Mm -hmm. Like, did that work? Um, so some of those students don't budge out of those right. proficiency levels, but still make a year's worth of growth. Okay, what about the students that made more than a year's worth of growth? What did you do? What, right. what happened there? Was that a fluke? Did the student not care one year, or did you put something in place? So the power for me tends to be on those individual conversations, and then what resources are working right now? I know that for the last few years, we've been really tightening up on our tier one instruction, and our tier two interventions. And what are those interventions? And are they, are they common enough that kids are hearing the same language? And is the thing that we're using actually working? This is probably more than you guys wanted for this presentation. No. So probably all the exactly time, right? This. No, you're not. Um, OK. You're good. Um, Al, you, I think you yeah, have to hand up. Points. I'll go down this. <laughs> uh, the first point was, I agree with Brendan that the state number really had, doesn't have any relevance for me. 
Yeah, we see this all the time in terms of comparisons. What is more valuable is to understand, first of all, SBAC has raised the bar in terms mm -hmm. of performance. Mm -hmm. That it's a, it's a t that's why I understood it was a tougher test. Oh, yeah. And therefore, and benchmarks and performance has gone up. At, at the same time, almost all of the research I've done in comparison on these scores has been, has been at the regional level, the South Burlington, the MMU, and so forth. So I like to look at the, how we are doing compared with other schools, with our peer community. <laughs> That gives you some specifics about which schools are doing really outstanding, and then you can ask the question, what are they doing differently than we are? Yeah. And, and so I, that is much more valuable. And we do that too. So we have um, put our neighboring district's scores standing mm. in front of the high school faculty and said, so what's Colchester doing? So what's MMU yeah. doing? <laughs> um, it's one of the reasons why we launched our literacy initiative a few years ago and hired right. Erica LeClaire, our literacy coach, to put literacy or to um, to strengthen literacy in all classrooms and all content mm -hmm. areas. Um, and to look at, um, we put in place writing. I know both Essex Town and Chittenden Center will put in place writing prompts to try to understand our students in terms of writing better. One of the things that we know is if students don't do well on their state writing assessment, they don't do well on the reading assessment and they sure don't do well on that math assessment. So that's the tickler for okay. us, is that we know that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence when they when they struggle to write. Right. Um, whether that means that that's an indicator of their math, true math ability, we don't know, but we know that on these state assessments, they need to be able to write to convey their math abilities. So that's why we look at them next to the local data to see if it's kind of ringing true at all. So who, Keely? Um, I wish I brought more graphs. I have so many <laughs> graphs back home. <laughs> Two questions. Oh, one, back in my office. office. <laughs> one which is about this conversation, and one which is about the final slide. Mm -hmm. um, on this conversation, I guess one thing that I've been wondering about as we transition to this unified district with 4,000 people is like, if you've always been having these conversations about a group of, you know, 1,000, 2,000 students, do you, do you still have the time to have this conversation about 4,000 students? And if not. Mm -hmm. Are there plans in place about how to utilize people who are working closer to the students to do this kind of analysis? They do. I mean, the teachers meet in PLCs across grade levels and across content areas here, and they look at the data. Uh, Essex High School <coughs> teachers are fairly hungry for data. They know they knew NECAP was out today, and we're asking you for those slice files. So they are looking at that. We're making better use of our data systems. Um, we could improve upon that, but we have data systems that teachers log on and they have the rosters of the kids and they can get their data almost immediately. Um, we always could do more. The day is long for teachers. And to sort of <coughs> sit down and say, let's sit together, all ninth grade teachers, and look at your assessment <coughs> scores of 350 kids and make meaning of it can be challenging. Um, but I do think that we have increased our culture of looking at data over time. Um, I think the challenge has always been to find at least three points. So if you look at your state data and you look at your common local assessment data, and, we, and we're missing some, some, some opportunities for common as local assessment data, and look at classroom together, does it tell you some sort of story? So this class, are they struggling as readers? Do you notice that? Well, we notice this on the state assessment result, but they seem to be doing well on Star Reader. What does that say? I don't, I don't think I answered your no, question fully. It, it does, because it's like the teachers are flagging the people that you need to be involved in the discussion. I will also about. say my experience with the principals in these buildings are that they are data savvy. So um, I'm pretty impressed when I can sit down with a Suzanne Grundling and she knows every single student that's what their scores are and what their intervention needs are. Um, you'll see data walls in each of their offices as you go in. They're pretty, they're pretty savvy with that information. I think um, the harder thing is finding the thing that's going to work for that one student and making sure the resources are there. And my question about the final slide is, we know that um, people on free and reduced lunch are accessing the tech center at like a 70% rate. But what are the um, levels of access for the other um, flexible learning opportunities? Um, it would be interesting to know, like, are people on free and reduced lunch getting into the algebra seminar or the Yeah, ABPA. I'd like to know that actually. And that one I think I could probably pull off finding. I'll have to go to two systems, but I think I can get it in about a quarter. 
once they, once their data shows up, I'll be able to do that. Um, the dual enrollment wasn't is an interesting one for me. I'm wondering if they're accessing mm -hmm. dual enrollment courses and whether or not there's a barrier in terms of getting to dual enrollment courses. Yeah. Um, that's a relatively new kind of phenomena for us, so I'd be curious to know who's accessing that. Mm -hmm. um, we also, um, we are experiencing a number of students who come to us who've had large interruptions in their formal education. By and large, they're ELL students. We're referred to as students with limited informal interruptions. Limited students with limited or interrupted formal education or SLIFE students. Mm -hmm. Students who arrive who have missed two years of Fun. formal education. Yeah. Um, and that's been a new challenge for us. That will start to show up in the SPAC scores. Mm -hmm. um, I've got Marla and, and Patrick. Um, just piggybacking probably on Al uh, Brendan. When the uh, article came out in the Essex Reporter. I work with people that have kids at CVU, at Milton, um, some of the other districts. And how, how far back can we go in comparison to other Chittenden County schools? I'd be curious mm -hmm. of how we compare in past years so that we can see going forward how okay. we're we should be able to do it for three years. The state produces a slice file, so I'd have to just go back and find those two slice files and do that comparison. Last year, I did the comparison for um, all of those students who were in the proficiency levels. I did it for the average scaled score, and then I did it for disaggregated, and Essex High School kind of moved up and down depending on which sub. So I had. would just be curious if, if it's in. possible to get sent that info once you have it abroad. Uh, idea of how we're going and then towards the future yep. but the other thing is what I'd be curious about is not only how we stand with us back and everything else because budgets coming up I'd be curious how our percentages are working out that we're putting money into curriculum versus athletics I mean what do we do that's different than other schools it's just not enough to look at scores to me because I know that some kids yeah. are stay in school because of arts or they stay in school mm -hmm. because of music. So who's accessing what programs? Yeah, I, I think that would be a great thing to have is for who we are, what we are. I, I think if you all can generate a list of those questions, I'll do my best to get you that information. Um, you know, our high school guidance department usually turns it around pretty quickly. Um, and I can definitely get you a comparison of high school to high school for the last three years. That's how long we've been giving it. Because I'm curious how we're spending our money. Should we be putting our money in different buckets coming this budget year? I mean, I just now that we're merged. And the other thing I heard you say is we're still operating on two data systems. When will they be the same? <laughs> so we, so we, <coughs> unify, the business of unifying, is a, it's a lot of work. So we made the decision about halfway through last year that we identify all of the systems that we were gonna cause our users to have to interact with and said, which ones can we bear the pain of keeping separately to not have to keep putting new things in front of teachers so they can focus on kids. So we knew that there was going to be a change in our student information management system and our accounting system. Yeah. What am I missing? Our finance, wait, I said finance system, our, uh, I think I HR. HR system. HR system. So there, we had this conversation uh, our, yesterday. Our, nurse, our nurses' um, health information system. So we did make the decision to keep VCAT and Inform both up and running for a single year because that is something that teachers interact with a lot. It does mean that it's harder to get data out and it's why I said to Beth, I don't think I can pull off a slide for third grade local assessment reading. Uh, just trying to pull it out of the two systems and put it together. Our yeah. goal is to have a single system next year, but we want to be thoughtful about what about that decision. There are people who are attached to existing systems, and there's new ones that have come out since both systems have looked for these systems. So we are launching that problem. We just had this conversation this week about how to make a decision about a single data system, because it is limiting. But we know that as leaders, we are super cautious about putting continual change in front of teachers at a time when they're experiencing so much change already. And they know how to use these. It's a bit like taking your car and handing you a, a new stick shift and saying go. Oh, please. 
<laughs> Not everybody Gladly. has stick chips. <laughs> Patrick, can you uh, So I have two things. Uh, one, Keely, I think maybe you might have mentioned this last meeting, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you had had a question. We were wondering if we could get SPAC scores that were specific to individuals who would come up through our system. Well, I realize that taking, you know, we obviously have to account for the ALL students and the students who move in who maybe have had oh, to drop with us consistently. But those who are yeah. with us consistently, I'm wondering if that would give us. I can uh, do it for three friends. years. I mean, that's how long we've had it. I, I, I had a little bit more fun with that with the kneecap since we had it for a longer period of time, mm -hmm. but I have a three year period. I did look at transition data a few years ago. I used to have like this secret back door into the state database that closed down on me. Um, but I was able to track kids moving in and out of the towns and try to figure out where they were coming from um, through the education data warehouse. Um, and I did it actually for Essex Town as well as Essex Junction and Westford because Mark had asked me to run it. And I found at that time, I did it three years in a row, that from kindergarten to grade eight, we were losing about 30% of our kids. So that meant that as an eighth grade teacher, 70% of the kids sitting there had been with us since kindergarten. I found that it was about 15% between grade six and grade eight, and about 15 to 20% between grade nine and grade 12. And that caused me to say, well, how can I track these kids who are with us to see if we're having that impact? Um, I can try to do that, hanging on to that information a little bit harder these days. Um, and it would only be for three years. Okay. We don't tend to have a huge transition in a three year span, <clears throat> but I'll see what I can reach in and find out. It tends to be somewhere between K-5 is the most movement. Okay. That'd be, yeah, that'd be great. Um, and then I guess the second thing, you'd mentioned hiring a literacy person mm -hmm. a few years ago. Um, I mean, right now, so judging from these results and from what was in the Essex Reporter, so we are sixth in English language out of the eight schools they compared. The two behind us are Burlington and Winooski, who have very challenging scenarios facing them. So does that mean that this the literacy person does it not seem to be working? Are we low and we have gained ground, or are we staying low? So I mean, we we're two in spending, but we're six behind two extremely challenging districts, so right. I'm just not really sure. So to clarify, we hired a literacy coach here up at the high school. We, Essex Town has had a literacy and math coach um, in their K through eight system for a number of years, and then we had a math coach K five here. We've added a literacy coach here. so. We actually lost our literacy coach. She became the assistant principal over at Colchester, Erica LeClaire. Um, so we don't currently have a literacy coach at the high school right now. I think your question, though, is sort of did the resource kind of cause an outcome yeah, that was less than did, desirable? Did the action that you take get us I to? I wish it could be that simple. I don't know that I could put um, a single year 11th grade cohorts drop on a single individual who's charged with support, supporting the whole school. I can tell you that I see and experience a lot more literacy in the classroom across content areas, and that was our goal, to make sure that all content areas owned Literacy Common Core when it came out. Um, and we were pretty strong, and we had a drop this year. About six years ago, I'm looking at you, Al, because I think maybe it was my first year here. I think I started in July, and the math scores dropped that November by 13 points. Right. I said, gosh, I just got here. Um, and then the next year went up by 15 points. I'm not saying that's gonna happen, but I wanna be cautious about how much did we put yeah. in this for a single year. Trend is a problem. And so I have met with the team to talk about, boy, we did a very different testing context last year. We chose to do it the first two weeks, that it was the windows open, there's a three month window. Let's revisit that. You missed three months of teaching. We had a snow day. On the one day we shut down the school for the 11th graders to show up and we had to reschedule it. Maybe not snow season. Um, do we need more teaching time? The fact that it's moving to ninth grade kind of changes the conversation now, because now we've just lost that cohort. Now we're going to be assessing ninth graders. Yeah, and I, and I do understand that. I guess you speaking to us as a group, mm -hmm. people who are invested in this, mm -hmm. understand that. When we go out to the public, yeah. they see two in spending, and they see six behind Winooski yep. and Burlington. That's, that's, that's not enough. easy for us to sell. I understand. So I guess I'm trying to find a way in my head to connect the dots between what you're explaining here and how I'm going to explain that to someone who says I think there's another What's up? there's another I piece agree. too and it includes the curriculum there are changes uh, in the curriculum in between all of these different subjects so it's possible that one grade can get a little bit behind while they're trying to make this so this is a lot of coordination mm -hmm. across a lot of staff 
Well, we've had changes in every state standard. They just adopted new so social studies ones. Mm -hmm. um, every, every state standards have changed in every content area since I've been here, since Good. 2011. I don't know that I would, um, I think somebody said earlier, Literacy Common Core did have a ramping up of expectations, and I think right. that that was a good thing. I think that their expectations for the integrated reading and writing assessments right. challenged us in a lot of good ways. We did, you don't see it here, but we, uh, Essex High School was one of the pilots, so they actually gave it the year in advance, so they had a year to practice, and then produced some pretty decent scores. Um, so I'm not saying that I'm not paying attention to this one drop in particular. I definitely want to look at that. I want to look at the kids on a roster level, and I want to look at the context. Um, and then I want to look at how we do as ninth graders. Good. So I have a demographics question. OK. Um, I so I, um, I want to confirm, are students who are uh, on free and reduced <laughs> lunch and students with disabilities in the, the total number? This is the all, all. yeah. And so what I'm not seeing in the, in the presentation is, are we, is part of the potential reason that our, sco our scores are fluctuating, is it because we're seeing a rise in these two populations in our district? I can't, because it's not, I don't have a mouse to go so back to So do we have slide. more students in poverty? Oh, do we have more students with disabilities? It's been um, having an impact on our overall scores? I know it's gone up over the I, I don't feel comfortable answering the question around the students with disabilities. I wish Aaron and Dylan were here to answer that one. Uh, what, where am I? Are we? And we don't necessarily need to answer it here and now. I guess yeah. my, my, that's just a curiosity I have, is to what degree are the demographics having an impact on our score results if we know that those two populations struggle right. significantly with the SBACs, if we've seen a, a jump in the population of those two groups of, of kids, it could be having an, an effect on our overall scores. I, I don't think that we've seen a jump, I would say, in, a high jump in poverty in, in the last three years to indicate why we saw a drop in our high school scores this year. I don't think I would do that. Okay. Although I'd want to look at that particular grade, which I didn't necessarily do to see okay. if that one is different. The slides that I can't touch right now actually were percentages of those subgroups, which is why the math didn't add up to 100%. So it's 75% right. of the students who are free or reduced lunch. So right. X percent of the ones that are not on free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's a good question. I think we it, it, it causes you to have to drill down again. Um, I can't answer the question about whether or not we've seen a jump in jump, jump <laughs> in disability. Um, I still would caution us. The word disability is a pretty big category. Yeah. I guess you know um, this is a very complicated and complex issue, obviously. But if we have a, I think we need to have a really good handle on. Uh, the kids that that come through our doors every day and if we if we can understand some of these basic characteristics it could help us with intervention even earlier and it might also help us think more broadly as a district is Essex and Westford in the junction are we seeing an increase in families and students coming into our district that have greater needs and how do we plan for the future you know yeah exactly so I think that to me is a pretty key question and it might not help us solve the answer for today, right. but it also might give us insight into like, whoa, we're seeing a, yeah. we're seeing a steady increase in these two populations that we know have greater difficulty with standardized testing. I think too that, that what's not in here is there are students who come to, and I, this is the anecdotal things that we hear from our principals, there are students who come to school not ready to learn, not having eaten, who aren't in poverty. Right. Um, and that's not kind of reflected in here. Right. Um, and so, you know, what, what our principals are often asking for are the um, resources to provide as much flexibility in the intervention services as possible because we don't know who's coming through the door the next day. So, student moves in, has missed two years of school. Two years of school, that's one of the ones we're working with this week. What kind of services do we provide a student? Um, one. Okay. Um, I, no, I think we. I'm well over. Yeah, I think we need to be thinking about wrapping up this conversation. Um, I'll take two more questions. Al, did you have your hand up in a minute? I, I, could you comment on how the turnover rate, K-8 to in high school, has changed in the last three, four years? Are students or staffing? Students. Turnover rate. In uh, other words, they're moving out of our transition. Well, there has been a huge influx uh, for refugees. Mm -hmm. There's been multiple ESLs. 
prior to that to that time period, it seemed like we were in a much more stable mode. And and there are all these additional needs, the translators, the parents on board. It seems to me that this influx and ongoing turnover rate has an effect. I know as your ELL coordinator that we have had a, a large increase in English language learners. And English language learners are a broad category from a student adopted, a student who's had formal education, a student whose parents are literate, students who aren't, or to refugees to interrupt the students. That whole category, pretty broad, that number absolutely has gone up. Uh, I can't speak to students with disabilities, but I think um, if you can generate the questions, I know Aaron and Dylan would do that. In terms of poverty, our number has not jumped, but I do know that Aaron and Dylan could certainly speak to the um, increase in mental health issues that we're addressing in our community. Um, I don't know so much about transition in and out of the town. It's okay. harder for me to answer that one. Okay. But I think if you could generate any of those questions and get them to Beth, we'd be happy to answer them. They always cause us to be more curious. As soon as you get an answer, you want another answer, and we do the same thing. So we welcome those questions. So send those questions to me, and mm -hmm. I'll collate them before I pass them on. Kim. I was just going to, we spent a lot of time talking about the 11th grade as popping in terms of concern. Mm -hmm. I noticed the sixth grade English language arts and the fifth grade math, and I tried to sort of look back diagonally at the cohort, mm -hmm. and in both cases there was a very dramatic drop off in both trend and cohort, and I was wondering to what extent and how that's something to be addressed. Yeah, one of the what your that, process would be around that. One of, we, did, we worked with a lot of um, consultants in literacy and math um, as, liter as literacy and math common core were coming in and we were warned that sixth grade was a big bump up in terms of reader expectations. And so to expect that on the SBAC, that the, that would feel like a big jump for kids. So that in particular, when we look at that five, six piece, <coughs> we're reflecting on, is that that rigor piece? Or is there something going on? Was that just this year? So that changed this year? No, no, no. That when we first adopted it, that, that piece, that sixth grade piece in particular was going to be a bump But up. we dropped from last year to this year dramatically in sixth grade in English language arts. Is that arts. on the one? Yeah. Hold on. I may have turned it off. So we're looking at from here to here? Um, uh, the six, just the sixth grade English language arts. So I mean, maybe it's not so dramatic, but then I, both ways. It was one that yeah. stuck out for me because we went yeah. from 70 over three years to 64. Yep. Significant, not huge from year to year, but I no, just. but it's a trend. We've And then at. looking at them as a cohort and going diagonally, I was yeah. like 71 to 64 was concerning. Yeah, so this is a curiosity. Yeah. Now, and again, this is commingled. It's more helpful when I can do it by school, yeah. and then schools can look at their, see if there's something going on. And then similarly, we dropped 10 points in fifth grade math from 2016 to 2017, fifth grade math. math. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Fifth grade math. Yeah. yeah. That we did a big and up and a big down again. Diagonally backwards, they were consistently 56, 56, and, and then, then 49. Yep. So I just, that stuck out as me as a cohort and a grade level concern. Yeah. And I just didn't know as you guys look at this and dive into it, it we just spent a lot of time talking about the 11th yeah. grade. So just understanding yeah. a little bit more maybe about and you don't need to share that with us now, but maybe later process in, in maybe before we get to budget, how and what you guys are seeing yeah. and what you think. Yeah, yeah we haven't had a lot of time with these. The only other thing I see is the bigger it gets, the bigger the district we are, the more num the larger number of kids, it's actually harder to extrapolate that. When I go back and look at each of the three middle schools, I start to see is there something going on in that cohort? You know, is it a cohort or is it a curriculum issue in a particular building? Which is harder to see when you commingle it. Mm -hmm. I guess the the last thing I would say he is I'd be concerned about us putting a lot of emphasis on grade 11 scores compared to other districts in Chittenden County. Can you look at like grade three, grade six, grade eight compared to Yes. Other her schools yep. in Jitnick County. Yep, the, that slice file allows us to do it. I've also collapsed it, so three through eight here, we've been consistently about 70%. This is a little bit lower in terms of math, and so I'd like right. to collapse it also that way and look at schools across the um, neighboring districts. Yeah. 
I'd be curious whether it is a school district issue or if perhaps it is an issue of when we gave the test, mm -hmm. the interruption that happened, the fact that we've had a, always had a hard time, and this would be true in all high schools, getting kids to take it seriously because they have so many tests in the hat year that do make a big difference in their future. Um, so, And we're going to lose the longitudinal data anyway. So. <laughs> sure. yeah. Just saying. But, yeah. but, you know, some of the other philosophical reasons that we think it's difficult to evaluate 11th grade kind of go away. So yep. um, that's why I think the other grades stuck out for me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you very Thank you, much, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And if board members could send me um, questions as they think of them, um, I'll pass them along. Okay, so our next discussion is on defining understanding equity. And Beth sent us um, a series of articles and also, um, if I can find it, some questions for us to <coughs> ponder as we read those articles. So um, I think it would be good to use those questions to frame our discussion. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So well, before we do that, though, um, I would just ask a general question. Did you feel that the article or articles helped you um, better understand the difference between equity and equality? Um, I thought Beth did a nice visual a few meetings ago, but I thought it, this um, added some breadth to that. So, good. <clears throat> All right, so Beth gave us a series of questions to think about as we read the articles. Um, and let's just go through those and see what kind of discussion we can generate. So the first question was, what assumptions do you think the author has? Anybody want to start? Are we discussing just one of the articles at yeah. a time, or? No, I, I was thinking we'd do all of them. So I, I thought about that question across all the articles. So what assumptions do each of the three Each offers? of the articles, yes, exactly. I guess one of the assumptions that I noticed in um, at least one of the articles was that um, spending more money on education equals better outcomes was one of the assumptions that I think the authors made. And, Sometimes they backed it up with data, um, and then sometimes they compared us with international schools, which is, uh, is always, for me, a dicey mm -hmm. comparison. Um, but that was one of the assumptions that I noticed throughout the, the articles, is that more money on, it, on education means more, more and better outcomes. Okay. Keely? Um, I think you're talking about the third article, which I think was the meatiest. I felt like the first two um, sort of yeah. were just riffing on that good graphic. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but the yeah. third one really got into data, which unfortunately the most recent data was from when I was in school. Right. right. Um, yeah. And yeah, I mean, there are a lot of places in this country still where they don't have the Vermont system of giving any money whatsoever to places with low property taxes. Right. Right. So I right. think in most of the country that's a very correct assumption. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Um, because there are people 
who are living in poverty and therefore they get no money for their schools and they can continue to live in poverty. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's, I think, the best thing about our state funding formula is that it sort of puts a baseline of some money. Right, it levels the field. Isn't necessarily good enough. <laughs> right. And okay. people who have a lot of money don't always do enough with it. Right, yeah. Um, here or elsewhere. But yeah, I, I think that's a pretty valid assumption. <laughs> but, and uh, that the assumption being also that the gap doesn't need to exist, and that uh, that whole third article um, suggesting that looking at programs and well-researched programs that uh, support innovative approaches and creative solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when if we well, we'll wait till we get to the aspire question. But I think there there was a, an assumption that 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 gap doesn't need to exist. Yeah, and the uh, education can make the difference. And then uh, across all articles, the question about the access to opportunity and, um, and, and framing the conversation around how greatly that impacts the students, just the access to, to that. Right. Thanks. Uh, there are assumptions, Patrick. I think all of the articles begin with the assumption that the massive amount of people even today, are going to assume that equal is what we should be striving for. Um, I think that was like the opening phrasing in the first yeah. two articles. In fact, they were they were like I spent most of my life believing that equality was everything. And I think that that's <clears throat> a hard wraparound, but I think it's true that most people assume that if everyone has equal X in the classroom, that they should be seeing equal scores coming out of it at the end. Mm. Mm -hmm. Kim. I think it was the assumption as well that the floor would be raised versus the bar being lowered, and that can be a challenge around <coughs> the conversation broadly when people don't understand that somehow it's taking away from one to provide for another. And I felt there was a consistent strain that spoke to the idea that it was about raising the floor. Tanya. Yeah. I guess I could, I was trying to get beyond <coughs> the assumptions of that, I could, each, each of them was saying that, yes, you can raise, raise the floor, <coughs> but what happens if somebody's already up on the stepladder and that's where they start, so we should just leave them there? None of them address what happens if somebody's way beyond where they already are. Yes, there's a gap that somebody is in the basement, but what happens if somebody starts on, on, at, at floor four? Yes, that person needs to come out of the basement up to at least to where, where let's say, the first floor is. But what happens if somebody starts at the fourth floor? Do we leave them there because they're already there? And, I, and each of them didn't address that. Okay, we have individuals who are on the fourth floor, as well as somebody's in the sub-basement. So you know, what do we do with, there, and then there was, there was no addressing that assumption, that there was nothing, they made an assumption that you don't, or I didn't hear anything that said, what happens if somebody's already on the fourth floor? So how, how would you expect an article about equity to have addressed that? I'm not sure exactly. Um, I think it's, it's a, probably a discussion um, that's greater than that, that, that really great graphic, okay, sort of thing. But it, when, when I look at that <coughs> graphic, I'm going, well, what happens if somebody's already on that high box, you know? They, they're not the short person that needs the high box to have that, that, that outlook. What happens if they're already there? And, and I see frequently if that kid's already reading, we don't need two, and I'm going. Wait a minute. You know, they should be allowed to excel to their potential. Okay, versus just because you've already got the average potential, why are we leaving you there? Are we doing that kid as much injustice as right not recognizing an, an achievement gap? Because yes, <coughs> we see that we can measure that, but we can also measure that achievement gap for that individual. So as we're going into individual performance plans that are coming up, I'm looking at going, well, everybody's not 
they're not all 11 play and field. Okay, <coughs> so how do we how do we allow that opportunity to be equalized or equityized in this case for each individual, not just across a peer group, but for each individual? And I didn't see there was an assumption that that wasn't addressed for me. Well, I I think the authors didn't have that particular problem in mind yeah. when they wrote the articles. Kelly, um, just to respond, challenge. to respond to, to, to Diane, um, that it, Vermont definitely, in general, seems to have less interest in, for instance, gifted education mm -hmm. initiatives than um, where I grew up. Um, but I think there's probably also educational solutions that can lift everyone at the same time. And it would be a good thing if everybody ended up standing on top of the fence in that graphic. You know, and um, I am not currently doing this, but I used to interview <coughs> high students for um, my alumni association <coughs> who wanted to apply to my alma mater. And I spoke to one student a couple of years ago who was running the peer tutoring um, organization here at Essex High and that just was a great opportunity both for her to learn more by teaching and the other people in that organization to learn more by teaching and also to help people that needed extra help. So any ways that we can support those types of learning initiatives I think would both help equity and equality at the same time. That's a great point. All right, let's move on to the second question. Um, what did you agree with in the articles? I mean, I agreed under the section of the third article, how can we reduce the equity gap? All of the steps, most of them research-based, um, sounded exciting to me and promising. Mm -hmm. um, not for this question, but later. You know, I, I kept sort of trying to figure out how do, how should I read these articles in the context of our district, and are some of these solutions applicable or not to, to the situation that we're in? Um, but but that was the part of the article that I really found myself nodding vigorously as I read it. So, yeah. yeah. Are there things that people agreed with, Keely? Um, especially that in that section that Brendan mentioned, the emphasis on um, early access to quality education. I mean, it would be great to see how all of these things, uh, initiatives that he spoke about have matured over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, I would imagine that many of them have suffered cuts to their budgets. Mm -hmm. um, because where money is being spent today is very different from where it was 20 years ago. And so much more has had to go to supports for special education and stuff that sometimes innovative programs yeah. um, haven't made the way through. Um, but I think in Vermont, Act 166 is a really great opportunity. But we need to make sure that the people who need it are getting access at least at the same rates as average. because. I know things like taking my son to Summit Pre-K was an absolutely wonderful experience for him and all the other kids in that class. But if I were like the sole breadwinner for my family, there's no way I can take ten my kid to 10 day hours day. a week yeah, of right. childcare. <laughs> you know, he would be with some home daycare in provider who may or may not yeah. be good at Turns teaching. <laughs> and there in fact almost exists as I think about that part of that law the greater capacity for creating a bigger gap by virtue of the fact that those who can access it yeah. are yes. going to, right. <laughs> and those who can't no are yeah. that much further potentially behind. I mean, Not that are, it shouldn't there exist, are some but people who are a means testing it. on that. There are some people who are accessing it totally who otherwise but would yeah. have less yeah, absolutely. good yeah. quality yeah. Mm -hmm. access. and. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, people who are shift workers and yeah. they can manage to find a way to yeah. get their kids there, and people who are English language learners, and even though there's not EL support, they're coming because I think it was Mrs. Grunling explained that like 
they have somebody in the office who will talk to you for long enough to get your kids signed up. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the opportunities can be created, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee full utilization of the opportunities. Well, and I think the state is is going to look at that. I think, you know, when you have principals who are really cognizant of the community, lots of times they can help make sure that kids access um, the services who really need it. Um, and it can be an advantage in Vermont that we're small enough that we can have those relationships. Um, what if we were, what, <laughs> I forgot, oh, what else do you agree with? Well, uh, I would say that each of the articles essentially said, you know, we should be providing for each to have what it takes to be successful, you know, whatever that means to be, you know, that, that, that should be provided, or there's an assumption that that's, that's what we're all talking about for equity is get, getting each individual to have what they need to, to be, um, if it's the opportunity or, or supports or whatever, whatever it takes. Kim? I also agreed in the premise that all students can learn and be successful. Um, again, in looking at it sometimes from folks maybe less invested in it, we're thinking about it as deeply as, as board members and educators do. It can seem as though, well, some of those kids just are not ever going to get there, and you dismiss it as not being a responsibility. And I felt as though there was an assumption that all kids can learn, and successful systems build from that. Build from that. Okay, um, let's move on to um, what part of the articles did you want to argue with? Well, Spire, Spire. I don't know if it's Waiting argue. for you to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a big list on his now. I don't know. Can you tell I like to argue? Yes, I know. <laughs> I'm not sure it's an argument, but under equity versus equality, eliminating opportunity gaps in education, as I'm reading this, I have a hard time. I'm white. You know, I live in a community. I know we've got a lot of English learner, uh, language. English language learners moving in, lots of different nationalities. But there was a sentence here. Um, As a career educator, the conversation about gaps in educational achievement, particularly the disparity between underserved populations, children of color, poverty, and with disabilities as compared to counterparts, who are white, Asian, and from better socioeconomic circumstances. I'm just curious because I'm reading an article and I'm sitting here and I'm the white person, and I'm curious why the Asian, you know what I mean? The, the Asian piece, like, was, is there any information on that? What makes the difference between a white person, Asian person, you know? Kelly. Um, in some parts of the country, um, Asian students perform at higher rates even yeah, right. than white students. Right. So for instance, in California, yeah. um, affirmative action in universities has meant that it's hard to get into a state university if you're Asian. Um, it, I think, is a really odd comment in our community because there are a range of Asian people and people who are coming from um, Nepal or Cambodia or Laos yeah. um, have suffered a lot of oppression. Mm -hmm. They're coming in poverty compared to somebody who is coming from Japan um, or someone who their ancestors came from China like 120 years ago and they're in California. Like people's view of Asians in America as a whole very different from people coming from Southeast Asia mm -hmm. to America in the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a hard part with that whole piece because I know they usually do perform better. So is it because of 
So how much is it of opportunities we've given people or what is it the, the ethics that come from within the family? It's that whole range of ethics because where I work, I see an Asian family come in or Nepal and they are so include they take care of each other they live in the same household and you don't see that with everybody anymore and they you know like they really take care of those grandparents and and make sure they're taken care of and the little kids that come in that treat those people so special so i just wish i knew how we get those ethics or those qualities across in our schools it's the cultural aspects Culture, as well yeah. how how do you you know in, I, I think the other question is especially with um, nationalities or different groups that are coming into the u.s what will be the next generation it, as far as will they continue with what they came in with or will the next generation uh, um, depart from their values That'll be. And then there was one other part. Um, it's on. There is a piece that talks about a major barrier to equity in the education system is largely grounded in the beliefs of those who manage the system. Teachers and leaders must firmly believe that creating equitable learning environments is a need and not based on the myth of meeting. Mer meritocracy. 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 Yeah. meritocracy. 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 A distribution of resources according to merit. And what this made me think of is so you have children that are doing well. I, I read this to mean if you have a child at eighth grade graduation or high school graduation, is that wrong that you pick out a valedictorian? Is, you know, no, that's, I didn't, I didn't read it that way. Uh, I took it that way. Huh. Um, interesting. Sorry. Really? I'm responding a lot just because I've that's thought okay. about these issues a lot. Like, I guess I just got a new job. I'm very excited about it. Um, it's an awesome job. I'm working remotely for this marketing company. They're paying me great. I got it because I went to high school with the guy who runs the company. And... I went to that high school because I had really good grades in a place that had like gifted programs and I did well in school because my mom invested everything in teaching me and I didn't have to like work after school jobs and I had two parents and if I believe that I got this awesome job because I'm better and I deserve this job and like people who don't make as much money or like have to work more hours or something like aren't as good as me and they're not as smart like that would be a myth because I had a lot of advantages that were external to my own abilities that brought me that opportunity right. Right. it was being well, in the right place at the right time and you know it's not because I'm awesome congratulations. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I read it as in the school system, as if right. the students are doing well, that we shouldn't be giving them extra special attention or the credit. I didn't read it that way at all. I read it as the difference between saying, we're going to provide this and that curriculum and who does well is who works hardest. <coughs> that there's no need to recognize the fact that everyone's not coming to the table with the same background. And so it's a difference between saying it's enough just to put this out here as opposed to it's not enough, and you have to recognize what opportunities you have to provide to make the situation equitable. I guess one of the, one of the uh, parts of the article is at the top of this page, 
where it states, um, we cannot wait for U.S. society to solve its problems of, of racism and economic inequity. We can and must take action now. And while I think that's incredibly noble and, and absolutely spot on, it also made me really depressed in the moment to think that um, <laughs> schools have to go it alone and, and that we can't sort of figure out how to come together as a society around this challenge. This is not an insurmount. 20 years ago, this article came out, and the answers are here. And we have not followed them as a society. And so it sort of made me feel sad that, you know, um, we often talk about how schools are expected to take on more and more and more of things that maybe were typically handled by a family or a church or what have you. And it just seems that more and more the the schools are becoming the place where society is expecting us to fix all the problems and we're not thinking bigger around how if we worked together um, rather than just leave it to the schools seems to be kind of sort of a common theme so that, that kind of made me feel depressed I guess <laughs> it's interesting that you say that because what I wrote down for this question is, do we expect too much of schools? Right, right. And I think we have to do everything we can, but we aren't the only influence. Right, right. Can we solve everyone's problems? <laughs> well, it just made me think of how many missed opportunities there are if only we had, we had decided as a society to yes. make this a priority yeah. and to not just leave it to schools to figure out. Yeah. And place more social. Um, I think sort of um, piggybacking off of that, the idea that maybe schools are the safest place or the most common place for kids with the least opportunities to access this broader range of things. So it continues to be put upon the schools, but maybe there's a place for us to gain voice around the the support that comes around the school districts from whether it's um, health care or health and human services and that conversation has been stagnant for a while it keeps coming up it's a recognized challenge and I can't help but continuing to come back to the reality that sometimes the schools are the place that these services should be brought to bear but not by ourselves. Right. And I don't know, I would invite us to think about where there is room for us to bring voice to that issue mm -hmm. and see what the part we could do, maybe, in getting some wraparound support that isn't just purely born financially by our district or schools in general. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay, let's move on to the last question, which is what part of that text do you aspire to? Uh, well, you, you, you know I'm thinking about, about it. <laughs> uh, I, I think the most, uh, I do support the author's contention here that equity is, is definitely the way we have to consider. And I reflect back on about three years ago when Jack Bellendorf and I and Vince Canelo, the IT, looked at one of the barriers, the poverty barriers here, and we looked at how students have transitioned from a regular classroom to the way our computer systems work, how education is being delivered, how they're gathering content, and it was really striking and the work that Vince did to come up with an innovative solution that leveled the playing field for poverty and non-poverty students. And I was talking with Amy about it tonight. It's an innovation that she's using in ELL very successfully. So I, I think um, there are ways of of achieving that goal, but I think you need to consider how, what are the factors, 
what are the limiting, where can we get involved? And that takes a lot of thought and a lot of, that's where the heavy load comes in. But I support the author. I, I think that it may be, uh, maybe a, a working committee of this board should uh, you know, be, be looking at innovation across the country and bringing some ideas back to the administration or whatever, you know. Uh, I, well, I'm not sure that's our job. But, uh, well, it's good I, I think we should be asking our administration to yeah. look at innovative ideas that uh, are research-based and proven to work. And, right. you know, what Amy talked about so much tonight about using data to figure out what does work, mm -hmm. to me, that's what's really important. Maybe it's a innovative will come out in our vision. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a conversation that started quite by accident. It was just through the insight and watching over the years all of these things that are changing and moving ahead. And from that just discussion and ideas, it's, it's really changed and it's evolved. And so I think there's a real opportunity here to level the playing field in at least one major area. Okay. Liz, what did you aspire to? Um, well, I really like the, con the idea of changing the conversation from the achievement gap to the opportunity gap, changing yeah. that onus on, from the student you're not achieving to the district, how can we you know, yeah. help you achieve? So that, that was fun for me. And, and then um, uh, just to what Brendan said, to make, how do we make those, all those suggestions that came out 20 yeah. years ago, thought that this is why, to look at those prog the research and those programs and really figure out how to fund the ones that are working and how to make some of those things a reality instead of bullets on a, on a, on a, at a board table 20 years after it was written. So, so there's that. And then, then the third thing I just would add is that when I was looking, when we were looking at for an equity um, definition to use for the Voices for Education work, we have, it's in your packet somewhere I'm happy to share, but there's a long definition and, and at the end it, it, um, it challenges us as, us as public in the world of public education to think of inequity in these ways, and I'll just read them to you, um, which are societal, socioeconomic, cultural, familial, programmatic, staffing, instructional, assessment, and linguistic. And when we think about all of those inequities and how, that's how education is being delivered to our kids, I just think it's interesting to keep those in mind. So, if anybody wants that definition, I'm happy to share it. But um, it's, it was a takeaway for me to think about within the school building. When I think about equity, it's usually on a bigger, it, it's not so specific to education. And so this helps to keep me focused. Other things that people aspire to, Patrick? Um, I really like the point about uh, they made about that graphic that we see everywhere with the fence. Um, but when they made the point to whether or not we should think bigger as to whether or not there should be a fence at all. Yeah, right. um, you know, which I think we're kind of starting to do with the proficiency based stuff. We're changing the idea of what it means to get an education. And I think that that's exciting. And I think that we're kind of starting to do that now, or at least in this last couple of years where it's no longer, you know, when I went to school, it was A, B, C, D, E. F and then you got your diploma and then you were off to college and if you weren't one of those people then you were stuck in the Northeast Kingdom fixing cars for the rest yep. of your life. True. Friend. So uh, this article, um, and I may be saying that I may be saying what Liz just said, but differently. So I apologize. But um, I am inspired to do an equity audit. As we're, as we're merging our districts, what are some of the gates that we have built that hinder equity for students uh, in terms of their opportunity for education, their ability to participate uh, in various activities or extra, extracurricular activities? It just, that got me thinking a lot about how are we 
just through our own systems and design, right. mm -hmm. um, right. artificially either enhancing or creating inequity for students. <laughs> yeah. um, right. You know, doing some kind of a maybe, you know, high level audit at first and then start to get, start to drill down, but um, that could really be a very powerful exercise uh, to think about some of those self-created barriers that we've built maybe without even realizing it that are perpetuating or enhancing inequity. Totally agree. <laughs> I um, aspire to the uh, distinction between at risk and at promise. I don't like the phrase at promise, but um, the idea of not seeing somebody who has difficult circumstances and thinking at risk, what interventions do I need? But just like with any other student, how do I enhance the student's potential? Mm -hmm. And yes, part of that will be the invent interventions to deal with the risks, mm -hmm. but you have to go beyond that to really nurture the student. I was a very big proponent of going when we were half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten, and I've been wanting for years for pre-K to be in the schools. I think 10 hours is a good start, but I do feel schools are the safest place. And I, I liked the part of the article that says start early. Mm -hmm. I think if we can get our hands on the kids sooner, and if we have a great program, and if we can get hold of the children, we'll keep them in our community longer so we have consistency. I think it's like a catch-22 there. You know, the better the the better we can do this for all and keep people here, the safer the community. You know, the most consistent. But, so I wished we had a ton of space and could just afford to put pre-K in next year. <laughs> Oh, with a declining population, we might have enough Could space. Be space. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what Not necessarily enough money. <laughs> the trends right. may work in our favor. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? Beth, do you want to make any comments about what you've heard? I was definitely writing down what you aspire too and they're actually all things that I've been thinking of especially the equity audit I think I've spoken to both Martha and Kim about that in my conversations about um, I think it, I think it's necessary I appreciate you the things that you argue with and to listen to that and that um, it was great I purposefully sat back to listen instead of throw out my two cents every now and then which I wanted to be patient and have larger ears than a larger mouth and listen and, and it was great thank you for a great conversation it does help me in planning and thinking ahead and what we need to what we need to do thank you I think Amy's setup with the data was good perfect timing I, it wasn't as purposeful as I would have liked to have said <laughs> like wow that goes together so nicely intentional it's at the heart of I really liked having this exercise. I think it's been a way of getting to know the board besides just the annual work meeting or Business. our vision meetings. I think this has been great for me. I don't know if it has been for everybody else, but I like having some things to read and bring back and learn. Think about it. Learn together. Yes. So thank you, Beth. That's part of so well. the Thank you for wanting to do it. Talking about. Yes. Okay. Let's see if we can be efficient with the rest of the meeting. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> test teams, communication. I can be real efficient. Um, to, well, maybe we'll split it into two. I'll do the VFE <laughs> update, and you can do if there's anything else about. Not really. Yeah. Not really so, so the big communications work is the voices, and tomorrow is showtime. So uh, 
We have, Good luck. Thank you. We have 52 community members who are participating in this over the next four, uh, eight nights, um, which is fantastic. We have people, we have three out of our five state legislators who are, who are taking part. We've got board members, we've got students from Westford, students from all, all of the communities. We've, we've just got a really great sample and we're really excited. This conversation sizes are 10 to 12. There's five of them running and um, and each, each group has a paired adult student facilitator to run it. The uh, facilitator training was fantastic and I think all of us are feeling really confident. Kim is facilitating mm -hmm. one. Brian Donahue is also facil facilitating one. Um, the kids are really excited, I think, the, the students to be part of this, and I'm just really excited about what we're gonna find as we dive deeper into this. And it's been a tremendous amount of work, and thanks to everybody who's been doing that. And Beth has been, all of you have been really helpful in, in supporting these, these um, efforts, and we're really looking forward to, I'm, I'm really looking forward to reporting back in two weeks after mm -hmm. these two weeks have gone. So, um, yeah, yeah. Great, that's it. Yeah. Questions for Liz? Okay, um, Marla, Superintendent Evaluation well, Test Our team. Superintendent Evaluation Task Team met, and I believe you received the um, job description. And um, the next processes were tentatively meeting on October 17th. And uh, Martha is mapping um, some of the job description uh, pieces into an evaluation model. A tool. Yeah. A tool. Evaluation tool. Model, I think. <laughs> so I would just add that we looked at a number of superintendent job descriptions. We looked at state law. Um, and we put things together. Um, I think what we would ask is that you spend a little time with the job description, and um, if you have comments or questions or you think something's missing, um, send them to me, and the committee will consider your thoughts. Diane. Did the job description come to us by email? Yes. Came later it today, right? was part of the um, update thread conversation. Uh, the updated yeah. about agenda. The school board meeting package. I think. It was attached to an email by Beth. Yeah, Beth sent an email with an attachment. It, maybe it was a separate email. Well, it could have been. It was, it was like 10 3 17 EWSD school board meeting package. So it was, it was in the package? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was a reply the, to the package that originally got sent out, and then, Be and then Beth replied to all of them. A link to a Google Drive Here, document. Can you just send it to you? Yeah, send it to me. Yeah. It. I got it. <laughs> How about that? Okay. Um, Okay, any comments now about the job description? You want to put a date on when we'd like feedback uh, back by because right. we are coming up to November, the formative evaluation. Right, so I would say before the 17th, for sure. The sooner the better. Okay. Um, I can't scroll down, it's spinning for some okay. reason. Sorry. So the next Just thing is proxy voting at um, the Visit VI VSBA meetings. So at these meetings, only one person from a board can vote. Um, and we have to sign certificates for the Visit and VI meetings um, for who's voting. And then um, I think for the VSA, VSBA meeting, we just have to have decided. But it will be helpful if we go to those meetings knowing who it is. So I guess the first question is, who's definitely going? So I'm going to VSBA, but I'm not staying overnight. 
I'm so I'm just going the, uh, the behind his meetings are Friday morning. At 7 so, right? okay. uh, 30. 7.30 and 8 or something like that. There are early morning meetings. So um, of the people who are going who might be interested in being the proxy for the board, having that? I don't mind doing it. I mean, okay. I don't have a burning desire if Andre wants to, but <laughs> it was a real thrill last year. Like, yeah. And last year it was more thrilling. Oh, that actually I, was I more thrilling last year. That was when Martha, Mar excuse me, oh, Marla was, got sick, no, and I was oh, the yeah. only other Prudential Committee member oh, yeah. there, so I got stuck with the voting, and it's oh, my first it year, means, and I'm like, I'm means, just going to do what Andre does. <laughs> <laughs> going to the meeting early. Yeah. Early. Yeah. Notice I'm not going this year. The early morning meeting. It's yeah, because you get. Get sick wow. every time you oh, go to Lake Morris. Put my back out the year before last oh, year. My. I got the flu. I'm telling you. Yeah, you should stay away. Uh, my, <laughs> my husband said that he was tired of me spending taxpayers' dollars. You got sick. <laughs> uh, okay. So do we have to send these or do we send them with a person? I think you bring them to the meeting. Okay. We had an issue with that last year, though. Remember? Which it had to be there in advance, yeah. didn't it? So then we'll okay, send them. so they yeah, have to get to sent. Them. Yeah. All right. Maybe photocopy them, just in case. Oh. <laughs> and then we'll photocopy, I'll email them, <coughs> and I'll send them. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can send them to Patrick. Yeah, Everybody will have them. We brought it by hand, but we hadn't <laughs> done it yeah. before, and it, and it was an issue. So I think I can sign them. I think I just have to put your name on them. Okay, so then the, um, the second question is who's going to vote at the VSBA meeting, which means voting on the resolutions and the business agenda of the meeting. Who would be interested in doing that? I am not going to because I will have a <laughs> well, treasurer role. I'm happy to there, my well, well, okay. I'm, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm okay either way. If you want to, I'm just staying. Well, I'm into that I, one yeah, too. I'm just staying for that. <laughs> I will be there. Um, any meeting, any who Shall we let Andre do it since you're yeah, doing the yeah. others? Yeah, well, for the VSBA um, portion. We'll s sit together so we can whisper if we need Okay. To. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so I guess we need to take formal action. So I'll entertain a motion that Patrick Murray be our proxy for the VHI Health Meeting, the VSBIT Meeting on Unemployment, and the VSBIT Meeting uh, for Multi-Mining Insurance. So moved. Okay. okay. Um, all those, any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. And I'll entertain a motion that Andre be ap appointed to vote on behalf of the Essex Westford School District at the VSBA annual meeting. So moved. Okay. So moved. Ken's made the Sorry. motion. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. I think we're at, I gotta find my agenda again. Um, it's still spinning? You're almost caught up. I bet you if we pull the screen down, we'll get that. I just gotta use the agenda. Okay, so um, the next board meeting is on October 17th. Is there anything that needs to go on the agenda that Beth and Kim and I won't think of? Are we going to have the final job description for the board to consider? Yeah, and the instrument, hopefully. I mean, they won't get the instrument before that night, so Brenda. I'm curious um, as to what the board should expect 
with regard to um, proposals regarding the future of student transportation in the in the district. I know we had talked about November as being sort of the time frame of delivery for that. Yeah. I guess I'm a little concerned that um, it's just going to arrive and and we'll have one meeting to sort of consume it all. So I just would like to understand a little bit more about what the process will be leading up to a presentation of or even a recommendation of options. Do you think the community should know that process or for just the board? Um, well, I think that as a board member, I'm interested about the process yeah. and if the community knows as well that it's a win-win, I guess. I, I just am a little curious of, as to how that process is going to roll out so that the board can make a decision on whatever the ultimate proposal yeah. might be in November. So maybe um, either Brian can address it at the meeting on the 17th or he can send us a memo yeah. at some point um, to talk about it. The advantage of talking about it is meet at a meeting it's then it goes on to the tape and right. so forth. Um, so, And I think to the question of process would help us know whether we'll have it just once and all at once for consideration or if it's gonna um, come is it's going to come with an opportunity to reflect and come back to it. Right. Um, yeah. So it makes sense to just have us. Okay. What's coming up? Any other agenda items? Okay, um, takeaways from this meeting. Amy Cole's presentation. Yeah. The Board learning uh, conversation. Equity discussion. Mm -hmm. Equity versus uh, equality. equality. That'll be fun to sum up in. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Now. <laughs> Just put the picture. Yeah, the, 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 the picture. I need. And I need then, a copy of that graph. And then you can <laughs> slip. You can equal words for the description. Yep. You can Photoshop us all in there, like s smashing on the fence. <laughs> Very powerful. It's like the Berlin Wall coming in. Yes. Um. What was I gonna say? Do you want to put something in the notes about the teacher who was chosen as the Vermont oh, yeah. teacher of the year? Just no. spell her right. I think the yeah. more her places we can. Is there, a, is there a, like a public uh, announcement scheduled or? She has um, a parking space. Like a, like, <laughs> <laughs> is there a press release? There was a press <laughs> release. We had to <laughs> wait to announce it until this afternoon or this morning. It was like about 11 that it was. It was supposed to come out yesterday, and I'm glad that I checked with the Agency of Education mm -hmm. before we said anything. Um, ben will do the his work on communicating it out as far as we go in our district. Um, Amy and I went to the faculty meeting today at the high school and Amy presented her with flowers and Rob announced it. It was nice. Excellent. Uh, That's great. Nice. So who, Patrick, I'm sending you the announcement from AOE. Um, hopefully. <laughs> um, so you'll have that. Thanks for doing that, Pat. My pleasure. Give me a break from planning pumpkin carvings. <laughs> <laughs> I have like 400 pumpkins that need to get carved. Oh, right. Let's Let's see. See. <laughs> okay. So, are we good with the takeaways? Yeah, I think so. We're All right. Then I believe we're at executive session. So. I will entertain a motion to go into executive session to discuss contract negotiations and employee, employee discipline. discipline is how it is called. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Thank you, Brendan. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those may. And we will retire to the conference. Thank you, Ari Chan.